Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. The new sauce for the Webernets. No, wait. Oh, wait. No, it's just it's just that we have Justin Robert Young as our our guest today. Got me kind of all confused. Brian Brushwood, how's it going? Oh my God, dude, I'm doing so well. It's been an amazing day. I've gotten up at 3 a.m. for three days straight, and now you're gonna see the results. As all my, I will I will suddenly be coherent and have important cogent points, and you won't recognize me. <laughs> wow, I already don't. <laughs> <laughs> See, that didn't take long. How you doing, Tom? Justin Robert Young from the Weird Things Podcast. Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you for asking, Brian. Uh, Justin Robert Young, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, uh, Thomas. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, you and Mr. Brushwood, and it's an honor to be in your presence. You're actually in the same room with Brian Brushwood, are you not? I don't I, know what would give you that impression. Yeah. No, this was, uh, this is, you ever seen that movie Hard Candy? This is kind of like that, but with podcasts. I don't think we're thinking of the same hard candy. <laughs> I may have seen a different one. I'm not sure. I just kind of woke up, and I was here, and he is the, uh, the, the, the torturous little girl. All right. You, uh, you check your kidneys. We'll get ready for the big story. This just in, the big story. That was a waking up in the bathtub because you just woke up joke but anyway i get it now i'm, I got there, you. I'm, I'm like i'm picking up what you're putting down kiddo let's roll what's funny is all i can think of i was like man i really need to see hard candy i barely have no idea. <laughs> you never seen hard candy hard no, candy's great no, no i see that uh what's her face uh 2009 began an amazing project called star wars uncut uh it is it was and is a crowdsourced retelling of the original Star Wars movie in 15 second inc increments. Everyone was allowed to just go out and take a 15 second bit of the movie, record their own version of it and upload. And and for years we've been able to actually see these as they get uploaded. There's been a great number of them. This week they released the director's cut wherein they stitch together all of the 15 second or selected, I guess I should say, 15-second increments to tell the entire Star Wars movie. Well, and, and there's a there's a lot of blending they needed to do. You Even in this state, it's very jarring as you watch it shift from people who obviously cared very deeply and made it an art project where you could tell that they rotoscoped stuff and did high-production uh, graphics for it versus other people who just wanted to get their kids who just in tattooed Star Wars. C-3PO on the back of their hand and had yes, it walk exactly. through a blanket. But, but, uh, but but they do a good job of kind of smoothing because you can hear sometimes people to recreate the scene they wanted to sort of uh, whistle along the tune at the at the time. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts right here where they make it into a, a children's storybook. Oh yeah, that one that, that one and the uh, the text adventure segment. The text adventure was, was really amazing. good. Freaking yeah. brilliant. But, you know, if you think just technically in in audio leveling alone, right? You know okay. like how how all over the. I just map. ran it through the levelator. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, because they had to blend, uh, obviously, no, the with the music, yeah. and of course, each performance is going to have their own pacing. People are going to mistake, they're going to go beyond their scene, and all that stuff needs to be blended. I got to imagine, this is an amazing patchwork quilt, uh, patchwork quilt of nothing but pure 
it's a it's a love letter from the internet to Star Wars. And I, I would not be surprised. Uh, I'd love to to hear an interview with with these guys in terms of like if they did any sweetening or or taking down because there's a lot of these that are very, you know, uh, obviously just a dude shooting his hand, you know, walking through uh, sheets or just literally friends acting it out with no costumes at all. And you can barely notice room tone and stuff like that. So I'm sure that they had to go in there and, and, and sweeten these things down so it wasn't so jarring that it was unwatchable. But it, it really, really is remarkable. And some of the comedic beats in this are just... Uh, just really a delight. <laughs> well, and, and it, it hits you on so many levels because obviously right now we're watching a scene where it's uh, shabbily produced, but you but you got kids playing all the different roles. It's absolutely adorable. What I love are the little ways that they were able to inject uh, commentary in advance. For example, uh, the scene one of my fa our favorite scene was when uh, was when Luke turns to Ben and says, "I want to go with you to Alderaan. I want to learn the ways of the Force just like, and become like my father." And as he as he says that, Obi Wan. <laughs> It goes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'll tell you what. I'm shocked with. Well, I, mean, I guess I'm not shocked, but I'm I'm pleasantly surprised with how many kids are in it. You know that that you think for a property that is as old as as Star Wars. And I was I was actually surprised. I went to the Star Wars celebration in Orlando. I guess it was not this year, but last year, uh, or last year, but the year before that. And uh, there was a ton of kids there. I mean, like this is really this is a franchise that is not going anywhere you know anytime soon it's not like this is something that people kind of fondly remember uh like even like an indiana jones you know an indiana jones thing might be something that culturally might not be as relevant to a generation behind me or two generations behind me but oh Star i don't Wars know certainly I, mean, I, is. I, I guarantee you i could sit and i could watch uh raiders of the lost ark with penelope and she would be she would be horrified and, ter and at the right parts and excited by the right oh parts. yeah and not, not, not to say that it doesn't play but just that it is it isn't Star Wars. Right. There there and there are a few things that are. So one million one hundred ninety nine thousand four hundred seventy three views on YouTube alone. They also have it up on Vimeo. Uh, those of you wondering in the chat room, they have the approval and support of Lucasfilm to do this. So it's, you know, oh, yeah. you're wondering, hey, is this gonna get taken down? No, not by Lucasfilm anyway, it's not. I mean maybe there's some other weird thing that happens, but probably not. Uh, they right. went to the trouble to reach out, get support. Uh, and actually uh, do some clearances for, for stuff as they posted it. Wait, 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 what's your bone to pick on this? Because I think this is the one thing that Lucasfilm has been great at. Yes, but I hate that it should even be an issue. Because one of the, and this ties back, I think it was a couple of months ago, we were talking about what copyright law was meant to be uh, in, originally. And, and under the original intent of copyright law, Lucas has made his money on it. And it's been so long since the original that under the original law, copyright would have expired. And now anybody could tell their own version of the Star Wars story. Well, Brian, I guess what you're saying is there's a missed opportunity to test copyright law here. Because what these guys did was say, hey, you know what, George Lucas, cool if we do this. George Lucas says, yeah, cool if you do that. And everything's fine. They may not have been forced to do it, but right. maybe they would have been forced to do it if they hadn't done it. So, in a sense, they're just it's just them saying, you know, as a courtesy, we'd like to ask you. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, totally do that. Well, that happens and, to and, me and, with stuff where I have it out as Creative Commons, but someone still asks me, can I use this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's Creative Commons. Go ahead. That doesn't mean they were forced into it. But I take your point, which is right. if they hadn't asked, then there would be questions, and that shouldn't be. I, I would like to see more testing. I'd like to see more pushback because no matter no matter how we got to this moment, uh, this deserves to exist and it's awesome. And I'd love to see it as more of a, of a challenge. Uh, in general, I want to see a bigger shake-up. But that's, shake your, up own. That, that, that's your own windmill to tilt yes, that, it though. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. It is. I mean, because like, the, the reason why I don't think they had a problem, and I, I agree with what your point is, and I think that, that you know we, we should be able to test these things because I think that they are at times maybe too... Uh, far reaching, but with this, it, it's it's a fan film in a franchise that has been historically for the past, you know, uh, since the dawn of of the internet and and pre that, they've been very friendly to fan films. So yeah, I don't think it was really, uh, it it would shock me more if at this point Lucasfilm's actions reverse course on what they had been for the previous three decades. Now George Lucas uh, said in a New York Times interview where he was talking mostly about the new film Red Tails. Uh, that he's tired of making Star Wars films. 
In fact, he's tired of making have, films. Or took us to kick around anymore, guys. I'm sick of you being so mean <laughs> on the internet to me. He's saying, fine, but my movie with my name on it, that says I did it, needs to be the way I want it. Why would I make any more when everybody yells at you all the time and says what a terrible person you are? Oh, man, I don't, I mean, d d does, does Lucas get to play the pity card? I mean, is that, I, I apologize that you have all the money on planet Earth. So sorry that, that you also have the frustrations of people who didn't like the fact that you went back and changed stuff and set a precedent. Wait, so it's that, okay uh, to be mean to rich people? No, I'm saying it's rich. okay to be mean specifically to George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, to, to uh, and, and to defend George Lucas, there is a sentiment that he has gone back and, and arred people's childhoods. You know, that is a popular turn of phrase. Uh, for for the prequels, and you know, you can only hear some of that so much. Listen, we've all, and I know because I've talked to Tom and Brian about criticism for things that we've done. And sometimes, you know, when 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 a, when a refrain hits enough times, it, it can kind of get under your skin a little bit. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are, are you are you are you uh, are you, you waffling? Are you pulling a blue cheese tilt in here? Are you folding under the pressure? No, okay. Am I, uh, under the pressure of what? I'm saying that like. Listen, I think you can be as mean as you want to George Lucas. Whatever. He's a public figure, and he's fat, and he anno he's annoying. But right. uh, <laughs> Wait, did you just say he was fat? He is. Wow. wow. Sure. I, I don't think... Uh, yes, you have the right to be mean to him. It's a free country, but I don't think you should be mean to him. You can... I mean, but, uh, like, but there is... A, 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 I'm not encouraging people. claim that those movies are awful. Yeah, they they are genuinely off. And that he But that's them. that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you know what, you hate the movie, that's fine. I don't care. It's the movie I wanted to make. And so why would I make any more if you hate what I make? Okay, uh, I I get all of that, but I what I don't get is uh, making a sassy crybaby announcement to the press saying that. Well, now, he didn't co call a press conference, Brian. He was talking to the New York Times about an entirely different movie, and they <laughs> asked him a question, and he just kind of said, oh, well, yeah, you know what? I'm kind of messed up about all that stuff. Uh, okay. he, blew, he blew a big pity zeppelin <laughs> over New York City <laughs> and said, I'm going back to my house, everybody. You're mean. Can, we, can I boil down what I think this is secretly right, about? Go ahead, go ahead. We want... New Star Wars television and movies. We want new stories with people that aren't George Lucas. Yes, yes, that's well, what we want, and I think that's what he knows we want, and that is what is kind of underneath the message. That would bother me if I was George Lucas. If what? I created something and everyone loved it, and then said, "Yeah, but we don't want you to do it anymore because you kind of suck at it now." Well, we did want him to do it, and then he made the prequels. Yeah, I don't hear I don't hear you defending uh, Brothers Grimm for for the all oh, great now was ABC or CBS is taking all our fairy tales and putting their own spin on, and we wrote those; those are ours. Well, they're dead. But, and they're out. They they exist now. It's a universe. It's an idea. And plus, let's not forget how much of his universe was borrowed from other movies. This is a man who 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 proudly stated, "This is a ripoff of old westerns. This is a ripoff." But yeah, of but old now you, now you're bringing it back to copyright and the idea of us. He's actually very kind to people like Star Wars Uncut, uh, you, you know, and fan film movies. But what he's saying is, I'm not going to make any more. Maybe he should dedicate Star Wars to the public domain. Uh, dude, if he did, he would ha instantly have all of the internet fall in love with him. He would have my, I would stand up and shout, and I'm proud to be a George Lucas fan, where at least I uh, know Star Wars is now free of copyrights. I think that would be terrible. What? Right, because yeah. how do you keep canon if it's, if it's public domain? Well, number one, and beyond that, like, to me, public domain just says, let's open it up for every vulture who wants to, you know. I really thought you were going to say Vulcan there for a second. It's no, uh, okay. Well, then, then uh, are are you saying that it's it's bad that uh, Night of the Living Dead is now public domain? Did that ruin zombie films for us? Night of the Living Dead is in a far different position than Star Wars. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's it's a it's a great masterpiece that happened to have lapsed into public domain, and nothing terrible happened. It, whether it was vultures, didn't ruin anything. No, but that's because it's Night of the Living Dead. I think Star Wars is is a far different example than Night of the Living Dead. Mm. And I think that this guy, Lucas, for whatever we might think of him, created a franchise that I think he should be able to feed his family and his children's children and his children's children's children on. <laughs> okay, all right. Yes, you're right. He does need more protection. Thank goodness. How do we get on this? We're supposed to be praising the internet. Yeah, let's made... get back to Star Wars Uncut, which, by yeah. the way, freaking awesome. Casey Pugh, well done. Amazing project. 
wildly beyond what I expected. I love this project from the first moment I heard about it back in 2009. Wildly exceeded my expectations. Highly enjoyable. Go to StarWarsUncut.com uh, or search it out on Vimeo and YouTube and join the, the you know, over one million people who have watched it. Uh, you, it will put a smile on your face. One of the other moments I really loved was when the, uh, the scene when they're all on the Death Star and they're arguing about how to find, you know, what issues there are with the rebel plans being, or the rebels stealing the plans for the Death Star. They, they re-shot it as like a Fox News interview. There's a ticker across the bottom and you got the split screen like we're doing right now. It's, it's so awesome. This, this is a testament to the best of what the Internet and fair use can do. Now, I know they got permission to do it, but this is fair use at work. Brian's point is not lost. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, let's uh, move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. You know, we talk a lot about on the show about shows being made available online versus not being made available online. And uh, Tim Carmody, who writes some great stuff over at Wired, has a column explaining the difference between shows online and shows on air uh, and how the approaches to them are diverging. He uses community as a really good example, which we've talked a lot, as an example of something that plays better online because it has a story arc, uh, it, it engenders uh, people to want to convince other people to watch it, uh, and those kinds of shows do better online where you can watch things like candy one after the other versus on air where you watch it sort of in a relaxed setting, maybe you're distracted doing the dishes, etc. Uh, and those are where shows like The Mentalist, uh, for, for example, do well. The Mentalist, for example, not available online anywhere. CBS doesn't put it up online. You can't even buy it on iTunes. Wow. Uh, and so he makes the argument that... Who saw that coming? We're, diver yeah, we're, we're, we're diverging in the kinds of stories that television is going to produce based on whether they want to target on air or online. Now, we're still very early days in this, and on, on air is obviously going to make more money right now. So that's where most of the attention is going to be aimed. But we're starting to see things like The Office, uh, like Community, uh, that do well in the online universe. And we're going to see the first tests of that with original shows on Hulu and Netflix. Well, and as we've discussed before, uh, you know I'm a tremendous fan of divergence across the board. I feel like the, the more branches you have, the bigger the tree is, and the healthier the medium is in general. Uh, I love the fact that many shows that could not survive in traditional uh, old media are able to not only, uh, not only survive but totally thrive Thanks to online, I just hope that the revenue is there to make it happen. And, of course, everything's looking very promising, obviously, with, like, uh, Kevin Spacey's House of Cards coming out on Netflix. There's, there's a place for it. Um, and to be honest, when, whenever we talk about what we're watching, I don't ever count anything I watch on regular TV, which occasionally I'll be at the gym and a TV will be on and I'll see stuff. But to me, anything procedural, anything where it's the same show – week after week and nothing ever really changes and there's no major story arc outside of like well this season we got a new sassy boss who's in yeah. uh like all of that i that, wonder if they'll kiss this season ex exactly like that whole world is dead to me and i and i think uh i'm glad to read this article because it puts it puts a specific difference to the kind of content that i watch or, or that i care about i i will care about a show like community or or you know your arrested developments or uh, anything that's got a long arc to it but anything that's essentially nothing changes week to week and it's always the same flavor, which, again, when we talk about Fringe, that's why I hate the Monster of the Week episodes because it doesn't progress the bigger story. Uh, and I, I love the idea that maybe what I've been looking for all this time is I want to live on the Internet world of television, not on the open faucet of old media. Well, I think it's all patterns, you know, and, and, and as much as... Uh, what, what we're seeing here is a correlation between uh, availability and just uh, patterns of television watching. And I think that that also just comes with, with appliances. I know for me, I got a few uh, shows that are currently airing that are on my DVR that I love, like 30 Rock and Justified, that I just haven't got to because my my uh, every single day I'm on my Apple TV doing something, be it watching a hockey game or uh you know watching a netflix thing and so i would prefer to go through the final couple episodes of downton abbey than watch justified which i know i'm going to love is critically acclaimed and is something that when it was airing in the second season i thought was the best show on television so uh there really is I mean like the habits of entertainment consumption are, are a really interesting thing and it's it's curious to see that now we are associating certain kind of content 
with our devices. Now, uh, Kuhan in the chat room is saying the exact opposite of my position. He's saying, that's why I hated Lost. I want to be able to miss a few episodes and not be too confused. I, I could not be more opposite in my I view. say to Kuhan, get out! <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think what Kuhan's talking about is is our old fashioned way of watching things on TV. If we forget to DVR it, you know, then then we are lost. But what Tim Carmody's pointing out on Wired is this isn't about that model. This is about the model where you go in and say, "I'm going to watch Lost," and that means you have all the episodes of Lost lined up, and you watch them in the order you want to watch them in. Uh, so well, you don't miss episodes because you're in control. I think that this is even beyond necessarily watching it in DVD style. You know, I, I think for for community fans, I mean, they might just be people that want to watch watch it week on week. You know, they just watch it the next day on Hulu, or they watch it all when it's when it's made available online, uh, and and it's just because they find it more convenient to their life that they can do this, or they have a Hulu Plus subscription that they have on Roku. You know. Uh, there's there's a, a million different ways, but I don't necessarily think it's always just. Well, it's, a, yeah. The, in the in the article he mentions, and he actually quotes Andy Forsell for part of this, who's Hulu's senior vice president of content. They're much more excited about community on Hulu uh, because while it's a smaller audience, it's an audience that self organizes online. They'll not only tell their friends to go watch it; they'll spend time convincing someone on a bus to watch it. Well, so, and that's the difference. And I'll tell you, this is something that ties in directly to the Twit experience. Uh, the Twit fans are very, very deep and loyal. And uh, when it comes to advertisers, there's a special brand of advertisers. And you know, I, you know, I can't speak to any of the other shows, but I do know that for NSFW, we've been sponsored for two years straight by Squarespace because they saw the demonstration of genuine fan loyalty. They saw deep, uh, uh, deep love for uh, for the for the product, and as a result. You know, they, they kept on going. So I think that's where it's going to survive on online stuff is, is it'll have a smaller audience, but it'll be something more intense for the advertisers. By the way, I don't think they're sponsoring us tonight. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's breaking news. news. We just lost Squarespace as a sponsor. <laughs> you know who is sponsoring us right now on frame rate, Brian, is Netflix. Oh, my gosh. I've heard of the Netflix. Yeah, uh, on Netflix, you can watch all the TV shows and movies you want, unlimited streaming for a month for free. If you sign up at Netflix.com slash twit. Uh, so if you're one of those people who does want to just consume, like, a ton of episodes at once, go check it out. You're going to find that. a bunch of TV shows you like there. You're going to find a bunch of movies you like there. And you get them both all for the same low price, which for the first 30 days is the absolutely Walking Dead is on there now? Yeah, yeah, it's been on there. Oh, my yeah, it's God. It's been on there for a while. Too. Let me just say this. Uh, and this is, I think, part of, of what we were talking about in terms of associating television, kinds of television with devices is for me, I just watch to see, it, it's basically how it used to be in school with HBO. You had all, all the kids who had HBO in their house would talk about the, you know, if Cliffhanger just came on HBO and you talk about that movie because it was airing constantly on HBO. Now that for me is Twitter and Netflix. Yes. High school is Twitter, Netflix is, is, is HBO. And so when everybody I know starts freaking out about Downton Abbey, I watch down the night and everybody starts freaking out about Portlandia or the increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret. I watch those. And now, all of a sudden, not only do I have a great access point, which is what Netflix provides, but also it plugs into my natural social interactions, like Twitter. Netflix.com slash twit. Try it out right now. Or if you're already a subscriber, tell a friend. We thank them for their support of Frame Rate. On to the slipstream. Just, that always makes me think of the social network. I don't know why. I think it's the it piano. Does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. It's first cool. story, Vimeo has a website redesign. Uh, makes the uh, the video kind of slide out of the way, but it gives you a bigger video when you're watching a video. Thumbnails are bigger. It's cleaner. It's nicer. You guys like it? You, you know what? I'll tell you this much. Uh, I It made me realize how under the radar... Vimeo is in general. I don't think we've really even talked about Vimeo. I would love to get one of the Vimeo, Vimeo brass on the show to talk about how they've gotten to where they are because they have very quietly, very consistently built up a reputation for one thing, and that's exquisitely high-definition, fast-streaming video. Like, uh, I, I know that YouTube, when I think YouTube, I think of some joker looking into a webcam or a guy getting kicked in the crotch. When I think of Vimeo, I think of art and beauty and uh, and well created content and uh, I, and I'm interesting how they put the I'm interested in how they put that all together and I wonder if a redesign isn't an important part about trying to build a community because I don't think of community very much when I think of Vimeo. What well, about you, Justin? 
I know uh, Vimeo got bought out before YouTube, I'm pretty sure. Bought uh, out by whom? Uh, I, I want to say... Ed Vimeo now Barry, owns it. Barry Diller, one of Barry Diller's companies or, or Viacom or something like that. They got bought out by pretty by somebody pretty big, I think. Uh, but they've always had, you know, like what Brian said, it was a commitment to... HD video, and it was a place where professionals put their stuff. They they looked at YouTube as, you know, hey, this is where the common people are. If you are a professional videographer, if you are, the, Vimeo is a great place. If you ever want to buy a high-end uh, camera, like one of those Canon Mach yeah. 5s or something, you got a bunch of demos of like, hey, me running through my neighborhood uh, with, with, with a Canon 5, whatever. And by the way, I should chime in and say in the chat room, they're pointing out that, that Vimeo does have a community. I'm sure it's there. I don't doubt it. It's just that that's not what... Uh, I cannot name a single comment I've read on a single Vimeo video ever. It's a ever, closed ever. testing period, by the way. So if you want to sign up for it, you have to go to Vimeo.com slash new and actually sign up uh, to take advantage of it. Uh, but but you can get to it, so uh, it, it's not something. If you're just going to Vimeo.com right now, going, I don't, it looks the same to me. That that would that yeah. would be why. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I think that they've they succeeded because they, when YouTube blew up and when it was obvious that YouTube was something special, Vimeo went away from that. Yes, and they Vimeo diverged. Said, yeah, Vimeo said, okay, HD. We're going to de-emphasize comments. We're going to de-emphasize views. If you notice, I mean, obviously YouTube. Views are right under the box, uh, and and Vimeo, it's way down below in a tiny little thing. I don't know what it is in the new uh, in the new redesign, but that might be something to look at: is where they put views and where they put comments, and if they've decided to change track from how they've they built themselves. Vimeo, as, Vimeo has a big uh, community of indie filmmakers. I think that's what the chat room is yeah. trying to say. And and to your point, Justin, uh, they are owned by IAC, which is Barry Diller's uh, thing. They started there. Yeah. They, they weren't acquired. That's uh, that's oh, where well, they were incubated from. They, so they, they were incubated from there. Yeah. I knew, you, they, had, I knew they had big money uh, from, from there. I think it's the same size money. They just have a lot of it. YouTube has passed yet another milestone. It now serves more than 4 billion daily video impressions. Uh, and Google notes that roughly 60 hours of new content are being uploaded to YouTube every minute. Ah, oh, I you know it's this is one of those stories that'll never get old. It, it was a great story when it was uh, ten hours of video every minute. It was a great story when it was twenty hours yeah, of video. Yeah. It's like you know, and and uh, let's you know, four billion is kind of a weird number for us to celebrate. But I think we're all happy to see more of our lives documented in the forever space of the internet. I, I it's great from a library sense. I think the biggest question for YouTube now is. They obviously want to get into uh, payment on some level, whether it be video rentals. Uh, they're out, they want to do more professional content. You know, we've heard all sorts of people talking about big name people coming in to do channels and everything. And, uh, uh, you know, I heard a thing the other day from from a friend of mine talking to YouTube people that micro payments are going to be a big part of where they go forward. Uh, I'll tell you what, man, YouTube really could. They could add some kind of chip in widget that you can put on your, your website because they're building all these personalities but none of the personalities know how to monetize uh and so you know un unless they're able to sign with with some kind of agency that gets them ads or whatever but uh meanwhile a lot of them if there was a built-in way to encourage people to uh to directly pay for their content i think that would certainly but, be helpful you know the question is 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 we've seen a, a very underwhelming response to people renting movies yes on youtube Will they want to give two dollars to Jenna Marbles because she? Oh, made I fun do. Of I, I because it's totally different. Because a movie is some dead thing. That uh, I don't know, Brian. I think I think that would be a huge mistake. I think if YouTube suddenly says, "Oh, you know all this stuff that you normally watch with just an ad in front of it or a little pop up," now you have to pay. I think the YouTube audience would revolt. Uh, so they're going to have to tread very carefully. I'm not saying they can never do it, but they have to soft pedal this to their audience because their well, audience what? is is we. We want everything we have on YouTube better and free all the time. And you, you are correct. Uh, the, the YouTube audience are all, all spoiled brats. I, I will not deny that. I'm just, I, I think all three I, of us included. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're just, not I'm accepting just, ourselves. I'm just, I'm just musing on, on things that I'd like to see, but, uh, but I, I agree. It's going to be very difficult. And Maybe it's there's... like early access. You want to get early access to the show, you pay $2 or a dollar or something. Well, gonna, well no, no, no. Let, let, let's, let's look at it even as, number one, there is, uh, you know, I think the, the tip jar mentality as a primary source of income is kind of overrated. But 
if you were already a YouTube star and you put something that was like, hey, you know, chip in two bucks and maybe I'll send you something uh, that is outside of the lifeblood of the content of of the of the stuff. I think that's that's interesting. Or I think, and also that I think there's a lot of people doing that where it's like, look, you get me for free all you want, but but here's a few extras that if you give me money, I'm able to give to you. Uh, what I'd like to see is that institutionally built into the YouTube system. Or let's say you build in, and either it's a a clone feature wise or you build it in itself but you have a kickstarter element to it where oh i you know, thought you were going to suggest clones host your show yeah oh, no, that would be great you'd only get the clone hosted show for free and you have to pay for the real host <laughs> uh but like we're right there if all of a sudden uh you know uh, somebody says hey i would like to do this and here's my idea you can uh, go with my Kickstarter. But you can always right. already do that. I mean, you don't need YouTube. Well, but, well, but, but, but again, it's not through... built in. Yeah. As, as we've seen with like iOS devices, it matters when it's baked into the experience versus just like, let me kind of describe to you in this video what you can do to play along. And then it's like, it's, not, it's just not going to happen. But I, I agree with you, Dom. It might not be any more or less helpful. Speaking because, of right, baking, um, Facebook trying to eat YouTube's lunch oh by my God. stealing away Vivo. A lot of those music videos you see on YouTube, a lot of people don't realize that they are from Vivo. Now, some people do go directly to Vivo to watch m music videos, uh, but if YouTube were to lose this to Facebook, it would be a blow to YouTube. Probably not a mortal blow, but certainly not something that you know would help their bottom line because they make a lot of money off of rolling out those, those music videos and getting people to watch them. But also, suddenly Facebook becomes the place to watch music videos because they get a huge catalog from Vivo. This is so big for Facebook, and it's they're not. Let's be clear. I just before we get misunderstanding, they're not getting it. No one's announced anything. This is a rumor that Facebook's trying to get it away. Right. Go ahead, well, Brian. I, no, it, yes, and let me back up that it, if this goes through, if this is what they're doing, it is an extremely smart thing for Facebook to do because face, Facebook is floundering in the video space. The, uh, nobody really thinks of Facebook as a place to watch videos, but I could picture But here's the problem is Vivo has a branding problem in that theirs are the most popular videos on all of YouTube consistently because they want to see the latest. Yeah, pull pull that top 10. I wonder how much of like last year's top 10 was Vivo videos. The, to, to be honest, they didn't even count Vivo in the top 10. Ah. They, they excluded them from the top 10 because they're so far beyond all the So they put Rebecca Wait, I Black. I thought they were number three. What's that? I thought they were... Wait, no, which, I, I'm saying like, like, for, oh, 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 I see what you're saying. Uh, of the top, top 10 it, YouTube videos, they took yes. out all the music videos because that would have been all, it would have been all music videos then. It yeah. would have been all Vivo, right? Yeah. But Vivo has a tremendous branding problem. And to be honest, uh, you know, Vivo, I don't know if they care about being branded properly, properly or not, but they're sort of positioning themselves as the 21st century MTV. Uh, Facebook is the place where, where I could picture, uh, there's a reason that MySpace organically became all about music. And, uh, and I think Facebook can tap into that exact same thing, and partnering with Vivo would be the right thing. Whatever Facebook has to do to make that happen, they ought to do. Well, and especially because what, what the value of those videos are is somebody saying, oh, that Katy Perry song I've been hearing on the radio, I want to see what the video for Firework is. And then that Vivo video is the top because it's the most popular thing. And that if Facebook had that, it would kind of have to still be that with Google since Google owns YouTube, and that would be a huge anti-competitive thing if all of a sudden those weren't the top, uh, the, the top results for those search terms. Oh, that's interesting. So you're saying when people search for latest Katy Perry video, they would have to number one result be a Facebook link to the video hosted one from Vivo. One might think because yeah. Vivo has the only official way to put that on. Yeah. Well, and, there's a, and also think about the open graph, right? Spotify, you're playing a song. All of a sudden, next to the link in your news ticker is a link to the video of the same song. Because it's all integrated in one big, messy stream. Uh, by the way, the reason, the only, the winner of us talking about this is Vivo, who surely leaked this rumor. Because that's the way that they get the price up for both Facebook and YouTube. Right. If YouTube's like, well, you know, whatever, we're YouTube. You know, we can do what we want. And Facebook wants to put in a competitive offer, if not the, the top offer that Vivo really wants. Right. This is the way to scare YouTube. Into so you're saying Vivo went to Facebook and said a million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? A billion dollars. Yes. Uh, new place to get movies, ladies and gentlemen. If you love Ultraviolet, which we know you don't, you have a new place... <laughs> to buy them. Uh, Paramount doing an experiment at ParamountMovies.com. According to TechCrunch, uh, the studio is offering their own movies in the ultraviolet format, which means you get cloud access to them uh, directly from the studio. 
So if you go, if you go to uh, ParamountMovies.com, you can buy Braveheart. You can buy Chinatown, freaking Breakfast at Tiffany's. I mean, you know, they have Paramount, right? It's, it's, it's I, an excellent catalog of movies that you can then buy directly from Paramount. And because it's ultraviolet, you get a download of it that you can play on various devices as well as constant access to it in the cloud. So you only have to buy it once. So here's the problem. Relax, I think, Jake. It's ultraviolet. <laughs> I think the thing is uh, people don't realize that in the globe of the Internet, uh, it, when I see something like that, I think in terms of like, well, I can do that and I can buy it and I can have the movie anytime I want, but I have to become a citizen of Paramount Pictures. And people don't want to join another club, get another login, remember another password, set up another credit card on another site. I understand completely why Paramount would want to offer this directly. I don't see any benefit to the end customer on this uh, for why you would want to well, do this. The benefit to me, if it's coming direct from the movie producer, has always been the idea that they get it to me cheaper, right? So the benefit of Ultraviolet is all the other stuff you're saying. Like, if I finally buy into Ultraviolet and it takes off, then yep. I have one login and that's it. And I don't have to create a new identity for all these different Ultraviolet things, right? We'll see if that actually plays out that way in the long run. That's a well, big well, question mark. But I'll tell you this forgetting much, I'll that for the moment, Ultraviolet from Paramount, I should be able to go and get cheap movies, right? Because it's Paramount. They're not paying Best Buy. They're not paying any trucks. They're not even paying iTunes anything. They're giving it to me direct. So why the hell is it that Braveheart costs me 20 bucks direct from exactly. Paramount when I can buy the Blu-ray for $10 on Amazon? Exactly. And the Blu-ray, I don't know that this for sure, might actually come with a free copy of the movie digitally in Ultraviolet. Uh, to, to be honest, like... Why? I mean, and I understand it's fun to beat up on people who don't know what they're doing. Uh, you know, like like Paramount is with, with Ultraviolet right now. But it's like, it, to me, it's they they are just it's it's irrelevant. It's not even worth people who are forward thinking, interesting minds like you and Brian are discussing beyond just pointing at the slow kid on the bus and laughing at him. Like, they're just, <laughs> they have no idea what they're doing. They don't get the internet. This is a death rattle because somebody fought really, really hard, wrongheadedly, for the ultraviolet point. But see, that, Justin, the problem is I actually think this is the right thing for the movie producers to sell it direct to me to distribute it directly. And yeah, maybe we'll have Netflixes and services like that. But as far as selling digital copies, why should I buy it through someone else? This oh. is what I want to see. It's but there, there's, a, wait, there's, but, there, there's a reason why these third parties were created. Because these other people don't know what they're doing. No, and it, they never have. But but, uh, but uh, uh, Tom's point is right. Now, uh, uh, keep in mind, you know, the, the, the ultraviolet format, as far as I understand, no matter where you buy your movies from, all your ultraviolet pur purchases you would be able to see in the same library? Is that, is that right, Tom? That's the idea. Now, it's not playing out quite that way yet, but that is the ultimate idea is that ultraviolet, once you buy it, you have access to it everywhere. Right. You know so, what? Uh, so, so again, uh, there's nothing wrong with them selling it directly, especially oh. if it goes into your universal library. Tom's point is why are they charging even more than, than you can get for physical media? Because they're dumb. <laughs> don't know what they're doing. <laughs> okay. And that, this right. is born of a stupid committee where people were saying, piracy is ruining everything. We need it. And forget all these other people that are trying to sell it legitimately. Oh, we'll do it ourselves. We'll go it alone. But it's the paramount way. <laughs> and then they do this ultraviolet thing, and it's a problematic issue from the beginning. The name is incredibly stupid. And now they launch a... <coughs> branded platform, which, by the way, nobody identifies movies with studios since Miramax stopped putting out interesting stuff in the 90s. Nobody looks at studios and says... And, and by the way, we're starting to see the same thing happen in video games as well, where people are starting to slowly figure out over the last decade, like, oh, Activision didn't make the game. They're just the money people who are selling the box Exactly. To it's also complicated. Nobody identifies with it. And the reason why they're not doing it right is because they've never done it right. That is the one consistent thing that has happened to the movie industry over the past 20 years when it comes to a new world of distribution. They've continually made every wrong move. Right. All right. <clears throat> finally, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, finally, just to note, we don't have to discuss this, but if you hack Android, XDA developers member V. Geezy has made it so that you can watch Hulu Plus from any Android device. Okay. 
breaks Hulu Plus free from support. So you don't have to wait for them to agree that your device is now deigned to play Hulu Plus. You're still paying for Hulu Plus, so you're not breaking any rules. But right. Hulu Plus doesn't run on every Android phone. So now because of XDA developers... You could run the Hulu Plus app on any phone you damn well, please. Uh, that, that's that's very, very good. I think for for anybody to be doing the yeoman's work of getting over Android's fragmentation, <laughs> massive fragmentation issue, uh, is is good. Time yes. for tube tops. Tube tops are the devices that let us consume the internet video that we like to consume. We only got a couple here today. Uh, one, a patent filing by Apple uh, at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that granted, is actually not a filing, it's a grant. Apple granted a patent that would allow them to gain DVR capabilities in the Apple TV. Please, 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 please let this happen. I've, this is what I wanted Google Plus, uh, the Google set-top box TV. to be. Yep. This is what I wanted. I, I've wanted this for, we have had a decade of the dark ages. TiVo, I, I still have not gotten back to the awesome experience of my TiVo from the late 90s. And I know that there's over-the-air solutions and blah, 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 blah. This, that, and the other, but the fact is, I still have the stupid Time Warner DVR that I hate so much. And my daughter wants to watch some movie or other, and I can't be bothered to find out what. To, to me, they're not even channels anymore. They're four-digit codes that match brands in which I need to scroll slowly to find programs. And if there's somebody who can fix this, let it be Apple and let it be this. Search. That's all I want. Yeah, I want good search on my of, of what there is to record and the ability to easily record it. Two Absolutely. things here. Uh, the specific patent in question is related to the organization of episodic TV shows, uh, but it does describe menu items that would correspond to television shows that have been recorded. Uh, so that's where the DVR thing comes out. Number Did two, just because they file a patent doesn't mean it's ever going to make it to a product. Sometimes it I does, but, sometimes but it doesn't. We're seeing something happen with all the ways Apple is flirting with the television space from all the talk about an Apple TV or you know, physical Apple TV and the Apple TV platform. I think they know there's something there, and I'm waiting for them to come riding well, Brian, in their silk stallion and save us. Brian, did you read Walter Isaacson's book? I mean, Steve Jobs said there, we've been working yeah. on a television, so there's no new information really well, gained. And, and, from and specifically, he's, it was, we, I've cracked the code. I've cracked it. I've and cracked then, it. And yeah, but it was like, no. Oh, well, I'll just put everything in it. It'll be like a television you really want to use, which in and is is you know kind of the the recipe of simplicity that you know Steve Jobs wrote to, to massive success. But yeah, I think that this is a this is a part of it. If I can have a TV and it looks really really good and it has uh, iTunes access, so I can buy things that I miss, and I can have a DVR that is super easy and super searchable, and YouTube and Netflix are all there, and it just is a great UI. Boom. Let's party. Tim Cook in the uh, Apple earnings call today, did refer he was asked about the Apple TV. He said it's still a hobby, but he couldn't live without it. He didn't really say anything that, that changed anything one way or another. Let's talk about something we can actually get. Boxy Live TV. We've talked about this on the show before. It is the little dongle that allows you to get over the air, HD TV, and even basic cable in your Boxy Box's menu system. So you buy the dongle for $50, you plug it into the Boxy Box, and then it just integrates anything you get live or over basic cable, uh, not digital cable, but basic cable, into your Boxy Box uh, because it has a little ATSC tuner in there. Yeah, does, does that mean uh, do the Boxy Box has actual DVR capabilities on it? Like hard, no one said hard... anything about it. That was the Apple story. There's no DVR in here. Well, but, but then how do you do that then? That means you just watch live TV over the Boxy Box. This is, this is close. This is a good half measure. But again, I, don't want, I, want, I want a concierge to, to, to just fetch me my programming, sir. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me as a consumer in terms of cord cutting is uh, major network live episodic shows and sports and if i were able to just you know flip on if i lived in a local market let's say mm -hmm. and i was able to watch all my sports on uh regular basic cable and over the air channels then boxy might be a a very close solution to a cord cutting measure yeah. now the the boxy team did say that they are looking into the feasibility of a dvr so it could be in the works brian uh, I, I to make so. it your per, your your perfect device, but I still I mean I still think this is a pretty cool device. For fifty bucks, you get you get the ability to watch live TV, and like Justin says, there are still uses for live TV. Yes, yes, there certainly is. <laughs>
And, and but again, as, until there's a DVR, it's like I I will never again be bothered to have appointment viewing for television unless it's on the internet, like I, I do with Twit, and that's about it. Also, the new uh, BoxyBox 1.5 software, which has already been made available for PC users, it's the last version that Boxy will officially support uh, for PC users, is now available for download today. If you have a BoxyBox that you use, you can upgrade that software. You should see an alert for that uh, pretty Film shortly. Film. Yeah? I just shouted Film Film. Oh, oh yeah. Well, then... Don't fail. <laughs> what are we waiting for? <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how to describe this, but Jonathan Frakes and Andy Anatko will be in an online television show to be shot at Macworld. I'm sorry. Say that again. Say, say those words again. Beckenfield is a, is a show that Jonathan Frakes does, uh, and I think you can get it online. Uh, if, if you go to beckenfieldmagazine.com, you can find out all about this. They're doing a panel at Macworld, and the presentation will start with the co-founders of the show, Bob Gebbard and Tracy Evans, uh, talking about all things Beckenfield, kind of a fan panel. But then at the end of the show, Jonathan Frakes takes the stage to announce the finalist and grand prize winner of the Ultimate Online Audition Contest, and they will shoot a special episode of Beckenfield live in front of the Macworld audience, including members of the audience in the episode. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And Andy Anatko is apparently also involved in this somehow. Uh, see, I was hoping, like, Andy Anatko would be like this gray guild alien that comes in and shoots lasers from his no, eyes. No, it's, it's not a sci-fi thing. It's, I think it's no, a school-oriented show. If it's not a sci-fi <laughs> thing, I doubly want him to show up as an alien shooting <laughs> eye lasers. It's a hard-boiled detective drama. <laughs> and then Andy and Aunt Goes Mutton Chops show up from outer space. Well, actually, no, I guess it is a sci-fi thing. I take it back. Muttons from outer space. <laughs> I haven't seen I don't seen know if Andy like Anatko that. can be an, uh, a mutton chopped alien in, in this or not. But. It's going to be a mutton chopped something. You seen the, 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 the handlebars on that guy? It's insane. Uh, students of Beckenfield High School asked citizens to record video diaries. Their goal was to share small town life through the eyes of residents. The town folk took to it right away, uploading self-recorded video glimpses into their very private lives. It quickly became clear that the Beckenfield was far from ordinary. The quirky residents are constantly suspicious of the local government's denial of the town's oddities. Snooping scientists, alleged UFOs, a haunted library, an earthquake that caused no damage. So, in fact, it's probably likely that Andy would show up as a guild alien. And gray guild mutton <coughs> chops. Yes. Hey, man, so I had no idea... That your friend of mine, one Richard Garriott, friend of uh, friend of the program, uh, shot this super secret show in space. He's a friend of the show. Well, uh, I, I was looking at Justin when I said that. Oh yeah, I, I was going to say I, I have no idea. Uh, Apogee of Fear, shot by Richard Garriott during his 2008 sojourn on the International Space Station, the first science fiction film shot in orbit, could be coming to v terrestrial viewers uh, well, and now that NASA has given its approval for what he shot. Well, and it's and understand also, it's like this thing is shot, produced, edited, created. Uh, it's uh, NASA just had a hissy fit out of nowhere. <laughs> they're like, they're like, now wait a minute, we didn't say you could shoot a movie up there in the space. And well, I, I remember he had mentioned because he was doing a bunch of uh, crazy nonsense up there, up to and including performing a magic trick designed by Brian Brushwood. Uh, but I, I do remember him saying, like, of the things he wanted to do was shoot a sci-fi movie. But NASA has always, they, they've really had a, 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 a boner about Richard Garriott for, for a while. Like, they refuse to officially call him an astronaut. Oh, no, yeah, no, they have to call him a, uh, uh, he uses the label, like, a cosmonaut, or they say, like, uh, amateur spaceman or something. They got amateur some weird tape. No, NASA, NASA, that's what NASA calls him. He calls himself an astronaut. Yeah. Well, good, because you go to space and you spend a, 10 days on the space station, you're an yeah, astronaut. You're I don't an care astronaut. what they say. But, but, you know, uh, also, uh, I, I know he did a whole bunch of unconventional things while he was up there. First of all, uh, what Justin was talking about, he actually performed one of the scam school tricks on the space station. And uh, I think it's episode 50 is where we had the uh, footage of that at scamschool.tv. But, uh, but he also was making a joke about, like, while he was on the space station, just uh, doing a little bit of Blair Witch pranksterism and saying, you know, like, on his ham radio from space, uh, saying, uh, guys, no, seriously, I'm seeing some stuff I can't explain. There was a craft, and it went up, and it floated, and it just jetted off super fast. And, uh, and like, NASA totally 
through a fit, they're like, please, 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 please don't do this. This We will never hear the end of it. Please don't. Yeah, exactly. NASA's always sensitive about that stuff because they have to deal with the crazies uh, yes. all the time. <clears throat> and I, I, I get why they want to look at this film, too, and say, like, well, okay, what exactly is in here? We want to make sure that it's kosher. It sounds like they're approving yeah. it, improving it, so it's all good. I mean, they should see it. I think they yeah. have a right to see it. What, well, and, and from what I understand, the, the, he showed it at uh, Dragon Con, and there's footage. If you actually look online on YouTube, uh, type in Dragon Con, uh, like Space Apogee, what is it called? I forget. But Richard Garrett, you'll see it, and, uh, you know, you'll hear the crowd, you know, uh, laughing or, or, you know, see heads in the shot and that kind of thing. But uh, it's, yeah, there you go, Apogee of Fear. Uh, it's... It's one of those things, though, to do distribution is when the, the suits get involved and you have to talk to the brass. io9 has a review of Robot and Frank, which they call the next great science fiction indie, uh, and it sounds pretty awesome. It's got uh, Frank Langella uh, and a robot who cracks safes together. Uh, essentially, Frank Langella plays uh, Frank, who's an aging, uh, aging person, and... The robot is brought in to take care of him as a caretaker. The robot is aware of laws, and et cetera, but doesn't have any ethical things built in to stop him from cracking safes. So the robot thinks that, like, reviving Frank's career as a, as a robber is great therapy. And so oh starts God. to help him. Uh, and then there's all Susan Sarandon is in it. Uh, Jeremy Strong is in it. But the, but the basic story is Frank and the robot planning their heists. This is, uh, this is a movie or a TV show? It's an indie film. Uh, I think it's either going to be or was at Sundance. Yeah, I think all, all the Sundance is going on now, so it probably aired or it probably screened there, and that's why everybody's talking about it. Oh, yeah, I think it did air already, or it did play already at Sundance. Screen, uh, Frank Langella, for those who that doesn't uh, ring a bell immediately, played uh, Nixon in Frost Nixon. Ah. Uh, but he's awesome. He's great. I'm pumped to see this. This looks awesome. Do you know what? Actually, and this is this is a bit off topic. Forgive me, but uh, uh, I saw a tweet or a Facebook post from John Dies at the End. Uh, I I knew there was talk about a John Dies at the End movie for years and years, but I didn't know if it got anywhere. But the the random posting just said, for those worried, uh, the movie's excellent. They clap for a long time after it's over. So I don't know if that movie ever got me. Do you guys know about that phenomenon? John, Not at John? all. No. Oh my God, no. It's it's great. Um, uh, pointlesswasteoftime.com uh, was a was a site. I forget. Uh, David Wong is the guy, and he's got this amazing story that you, I believe you can still read the entire novel online for free, or you can buy the book. But it's this. Uh, it's like um, slackers fighting uh, supernatural crime. Uh, by everything's convoluted and weird, and it's ju it's just awesome. It's way way awesome. You should read it. But apparently, uh, I heard about the movie by rights for the for a long time now. <laughs> apparently, that also happened at Sundance. Now we already know Game of Thrones returning for a second season here in the U.S. on April first. Uh, but a an excellent decision has been made for you U.K. Uh, viewers. You will get it on Sky Atlantic Monday, April second. So. Less than 24 hours after it airs in the U.S., Game of Thrones coming to the U.K. for season two. Uh, Man, what a different world we live in. Everything's all simultaneous release now. That's great. No, well, far from everything, Brian. Uh, well, more. We'll talk about that in what we watched in a few moments. It's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Touche, I mean, sir. Consider this payback for Doctor Who. <laughs> Eat it. Well, no, no, he's, no, it's payback in that they started simultaneously airing Doctor Who in the U.S. at the same time as the U.K., so we're paying them back by allowing Game of Thrones to be aired. Yes, really. yeah. Like, yeah. Like, we get a couple hours later, and, and because a couple hours later to them would be, like, three in the morning from yeah. when uh, Game of Thrones airs here in America, they get it the next day when they're all up and eating scones. I'm just going to move this along here. Uh, James Cameron thinks that he, if he shoots in 60 frames per second that it will look better uh, for you. Uh, so will, he's always going to do it. A lot of people agree with this. Check it out. There's an article on Wired, Wired.com. Also, Monty Python finally coming to Blu-ray March 6th and an iPad app coming along with it. So check I that like out as well. App. I, don't, I don't know that comedy gets any better at higher resolution, though. Well, we have... All the Monty Python sketches where the sets literally fall apart and the walls shake, you can now see in glorious Blu-ray. Yeah. We don't have a, a summer movie or a winter movie draft anymore. There will be a new. We're going to do a summer movie draft, right? 
Of course, of course, yeah, absolutely. Got, yeah, uh, so I could not finish last for until, the first, first time ever in the game I invented. That'd be really great. Until then, we will try to tell you about the movies that are coming out this week because that's kind of what the movie draft does. Uh, nothing. There's nothing coming out. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Hey, uh, there's something coming out on on demand on the 27th. Uh, that is Tim and Eric's billion dollar. Oh my movie. God, dude! Tim and Eric are very acquired taste, but there's something about them that's just hypnotic that I it, find it, so funny. Aired at Sundance to rave reviews. Oh, that's great. So, that's great. Uh, or screened at Sundance rather. So I am very excited to to see that personally. And uh, like like Brian said, if you're not into absurdist stuff, then uh, you are not gonna dig it. But uh, apparently, the movie is is very well done. Let's move yep. on to what we're watching. watching so speaking of things airing at the same time all around the world how's sherlock oh my god is so good the second season is so much better those than the tickets to fly to the uk to watch it legally over the air must be really uh, expensive look, clearly clearly i actually went to the uk because all the traffic logs show that i had a uk ip address so right? i don't see I know that's what i'm saying pretend to be in the uk to legally use the bbc iplayer app in order to watch the second season of sherlock can I can I ask a question? Why don't we just have we all have friends that live in in Britain, right? Like, yeah. why don't we just all chip in and have them get another box, right? They don't even need to hook it up to a TV. Oh, hook up a sling sling box. We put a sling box on it. We all just split the 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 user the user and the, the license box. fee, the t TV license fee. That's fine. Well, he's already paid for the license fee. It's the same as us borrowing his TV. Yeah. We just, yeah, we just told him to get another box. We uh, get Terpster on the phone, and we can have another box in that dude's house. We put oh, a slick box great. on it. No one needs to torn anything Harris. else. I can I just mean, see it. Terpster, Terpster's video constantly sucks from now on in every video podcast he's on because we're all <laughs> using the sling box to watch Sherlock. Will Harris. Will Harris likes that SFW show. Yeah, sure. He'll go along with oh, yeah, it. Yeah, and he's, he just made a big deal with News Corp, so he can, he can afford to buy us a sling box. Yeah. Is that illegal? Would that be illegal? I don't know. I bet that's illegal somehow. Well, well, we'll, but it's we'll not clearly that. illegal. Le legal versus ethical, of course, is a big uh, factor in our feedback. But let me just say, Sherlock season two is amazing. Yeah, we're not getting the feedback. We've, we've run out of time. No, no. Okay. Uh, uh, also, rewatched all of Avatar. It's amazing. Legend of Korra is coming out, and uh, and I've finished watching the increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret. Also amazing. I have been watching Star Trek, the original series, on Netflix because I was sick last week, and I just laid in bed, and I was like, you know when you're sick, you just kind of don't want to watch, do anything that's brain taxing, at least at my advanced age. So I just I just started watching Star Trek, and the, it totally experienced that thing we were talking about earlier where it's just like, watch one, okay, let's watch the next one, okay. Watching, you know, the uniforms change in the early days, and characters get introduced, and just freaking fantastic i've got all these things on my dvr that are new shows i don't even care about i just want to go watch more star trek when oh, i get home and are we going to be old men now where we just want to turn in and <laughs> re-experience our favorite uh, memories from yesteryear yes Yes. Oh, man. Yes, you are <laughs> yes i am uh also i did i did watch i did keep watching fringe uh i'm a little worried like i'm not as like compelled by this current new plot arc it's totally a story arc this season i'm not gonna say anything more i'm not feeling the bite like i did last season so i'm a little worried two episodes into this what's well, it's mid-season restart essentially uh and i did finish friday night lights on uh, netflix and uh last two seasons absolutely fantastic absolutely loved it yeah i actually think i i am gonna jump into friday night lights and, and you sold me on it by the fact that even my uh, like the, we talked about it before, the reason I haven't watched it is because I hated the, the the worship of football when I lived in it in, in small town in Texas. So the idea of a small town Texas where they worship fo football didn't appeal to me. But but if you give if you vouch for it and say that's why I'll love it, then I'll watch it. No, it, it, it it's very much a commentary on that culture and and the goods and bads of it. And Justin, you were saying you were watching all of Downton Abbey on Netflix. I watched me some Downton Abbey. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I really, really like it. I, obviously, it's something that a lot of people are talking about on Twitter. I think it's extremely well done. The acting is great. Uh, the one, It's kind of hard to watch that show and not compare it to Mad Men, um, just in terms of the, the, the themes explored and how they handle looking at a bygone age from a modern viewpoint. Uh, 
And in in that, I, I will say I was kind of it reminded me a lot of why I love Mad Men because I think Mad Men handles some of the stuff a little bit more artfully than than Downton did. But all that being said, it's very it's a lot of British people doing some just preposterously British things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I certainly did enjoy it. And it's on Netflix. It's like the seven origi- episodes. The original title was uh, So Damn British, the series. Oh, dude. Yeah. They're just getting so British all up in each other's business. And they're talking about, like, backbenchers and parliament and, and tea. And that's uh, so British. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. They remi- it reminds me of what it was really like back then. Uh, all right. <laughs> Look, I, I, know, I know that we're running out of time. I would like to do just a little bit of feedback. Do we have time for a little I bit of feedback? I believe it is time for feedback. Yes. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio, yeah. Matthew Brown. You got negative four minutes, go. Okay, here we go. The answer to Brian's specific problem is simple. Since Sherlock is co-produced by PBS, who rely on a totally different revenue model, that of donations and government funding, you viewing it on their channel doesn't matter as much. Since some of your tax dollars already go to PBS, you have already, quote-unquote, paid something for it. If you don't feel this is adequate, you can always support your local station during their next pledge drive. That way, they have the money to produce slash license more content like Sherlock. Yeah, the money they get from the government is not nearly enough to keep those stations going. So if you wanted to make this feel more ethical, you would you would donate something to the PBS station, I think. Yeah, correct. And maybe I will do exactly that. Okay, here's the thing. This is a great uh, email from Steve Conning who gives a series of questions. We only have a little bit of time, so we're just going to give a, a, a quick response on legal or ethical or both, okay? Situation one, I have physical DVDs in my, in my hand. Uh, is it okay? And I want to watch it on my iPad. Uh, is it okay to use software to bypass the copy protection to rip and transcode it? Not legal, legal but, but definitely ethical in my opinion. All right, me too. Yeah. Okay. B, I have the DVD in my hand. Is it okay to download a copy of the same of the exact same disc rather than ripping and transcoding? By you he means pi- without paying for it. Again, not Wouldn't, legal, possibly ethical. I I can't imagine there's any difference. It's going to be the exact same bits in the exact same order, just somebody else bothered to encode it. So, I'm going to say I'm going to say ethical. I would say the only thing is if, if slightly if, if dangerous. By by the uh, by you downloading it. Uh, if it moves it up higher in rankings, that would make more people more likely to download it illegally. Uh, then that would uh, yeah, you're participating in the culture. That's a good point. I, I own the DVD. I have the DVD at my parents' home, but you left his copy there. Is it okay to download a copy of the same disc rather than ripping and transcoding? Obviously, and again, all of these things are not legal. Uh, I think the answer to, to this question is the same as the last question. Possibly ethical. But again, you're participating in the culture of piracy, et cetera, et cetera. All right, now, now here's one. Here's one where I think you start to diverge here. I have the DVD in my hand. Is it okay to download a higher resolution version of the same movie? I say at that point, uh, I'm going to say it's less ethical, but it also matters on whether or not it's available. It's offered, yeah, because because then you're in bootleg territory. I know. Well, yeah, I know. Again, it's definitely not legal. My qu- this starts to go into the to the realm of should content be free? But yeah, you're right. Uh, what about this? Now, the reverse, I think this is ethical. I have the Blu-ray in my hand. Is it okay to download a lower-resolution version of the same movie? Again, not legal. None of this stuff is legal. Uh, I give the same answer to this as I gave, gave to the second and third, which is possibly ethical. Again, you're, you're, it's the same thing. You're participating in this culture of, of infringement. Who downloads a lower resolution? What, no, yeah, if you want to put it on your phone. It's, you have just a, it's a hypothetical. You don't need to, yeah. I mean, I've done that. I mean, theoretically. Uh, okay, what about uh, uh, if the movie's not available, out of stock, out of print, or regionally restricted, is it okay to buy a local version then download another copy that the fan, that has, like, fan subtitles added? Because that's how I experienced Samurai Cham- Champloo, the, uh, the anime. Um, I don't understand. Uh, like it's not like like I support Sam- you watching Samurai Champloo. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, like Samurai Champloo was only out in Japan and it was not available anywhere in the United States. But it you, it's a- okay to buy a local version means it is out. It's just out without subtitles. Oh, okay, no, that's a good point. Well, let's say let's say you wanted uh, uh, the, the 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 original with fam subtitles, but it wasn't available locally. So you bought the crappy dubbed into English version, but then you went online and downloaded the original Japanese with fan subtitles. I would say questionably ethical, but. Certainly illegal. Bar- right. No, no, it's not legal at all. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, it's certainly illegal. Yeah, yeah you yeah, said yeah. illegal. Okay. Uh, um, possibly, uh, yeah. Po- you're participating in the culture of infringement. Yeah. Okay, to download with the intent to buy it. As no. Soon as 
to you. No, I agree. No, the intent is not enough to be ethical. But, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, though. Uh, with the intent to buy, see, and again, that is how I experienced Samurai Champloo. It was not available anywhere in the United States. I, I saw it originally totally in Japanese with fan subtitles, fell in love with it, and then, and then it hit Adult Swim. I don't care I, whether you intend to buy it someday. That, forget that part. What you're saying is, if it's not available to me in any legal way, is it okay to go download it? And the answer is, ethically, no, it's not. You, it sucks, but it doesn't mean you get to just break, break the law that way. Oh, my God, there's got to be some way to... It, it's it's so unfair. Like, if you're obsessed with the Grateful Dead, it's just illegal to, to you know... What would not... make it ethical is if you'd then sent money to the company that makes it or something. But you can't you can't just intend to pay for it someday. Or went on, like, if you Google translated the language in Amazon.jp and bought the DVD from there. There you from go. Japan. Some, where somehow the money gets there could be possible. But again, so it's all participating stupid. in a culture of body, body, body. This is uh, yeah. This is this is the frustration of global hegemony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, totally different situation for the third part. Uh, is it okay to re-download content that you once purchased but is no longer playable? Stuff like you bought it on CD, but then the CD got melted in a fire. Which literally no, it's still not legal to do that. That's what's stupid about all this. But I think that would should be totally ethical because you did purchase it. You should have been able to make a backup of it so that it didn't become unplayable in the first but, place. But let's say let, let's say you did make a backup of it and both got destroyed in a fire. Oh, wait a right. minute. A is you bought it on Ultraviolet. So, of course, you can re-download it. No. Hey. Wait, 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 before this was a thing, right? Right. Before downloading stuff on the internet was a thing, you were not entitled to walk into a record store and and just pick up another copy for free, right? Right. Well, yeah, but, but again, that the, the second the difference is in those days, the second copy cost them something. Well, yeah, you deprived <laughs> someone else of that copy, whereas no. when you download it, you're not depriving anyone else of the copy. Exactly. Except for distribution rights and the right to distribute. No, you're not depriving them of their right to distribute. You are you are changing those dynamics. You are making it less valuable. No, uh, not necessarily. You're I mean, you're 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 ref because again, you should have the right to have made a backup copy because you can say that making a back. In fact, that's the argument in pre in preventing you from making backup copies is that you have then affected the distribution. When you start getting into that area, you're starting to deal with imaginary concepts. Uh, well, okay. Okay. Yeah. Last one. Somebody in the chat room actually said it jokingly, but he totally nailed it. What he said in the chat room is, I bought it in wax cylinders. Now I can't play it. But the <laughs> last one is, I have the movie on VHS, but no players. Can I download a digital version? Uh, I'm going to say, luckily, I think for most people, this is going to go away because, like, that's how I own, I own Time Bandits on uh, VHS. And I wanted to show the kids, but, of course, we don't have a VHS player anymore. But luckily, it happened to be on Netflix. Um, this is I mean, where the industry wants to have it both ways, actually. Because, of yeah. course, none of this stuff is legal. I get that out of the way. But they say, well, you're not buying the movie. You're buying the right to watch the movie. So if that's true, if my yeah. vi videotape is broken, I still own the right to watch it. Exactly. Exactly. But then meanwhile, of course, when I go to download right. it, they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, you had it on VHS. You but, can't just watch it in But if way. I own the movie... It, it's the right to watch the VHS version. Uh, you're not buying... Uh, in perpetuity, right? So stupid. I, I want to suck them in ways in. What, what, their, what their point is. I want to set fire yeah, yeah. to the whole stupid industry. This is ridiculous. You guys are always so political on this show. <laughs> it gets me very excited. <laughs> There's a reason people are, are fervently into Frank. I just want to go. I just right, look, I'm done with you. Set fire to the industry. Fire! <laughs> Burn it down! <laughs> We're starting a revolution! <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Justin Robert Young, thank you so much for joining us on Frame Rate. Uh, before you set yourself on fire in the middle of Hollywood and Vine, let folks know where they can find your posthumous works online. Hi. I really throwing the chair only hurts me. Uh, it didn't hurt Hollywood. Don't do it, kids. Uh, go ahead. Uh, iTricks.com. I write at com. I write about Bigfoot. Uh, NSFWshow.com. I talk about complete nonsense with Brian. FSL tonight. I talk about... Um, copyrighted uh, franchises <laughs> yes. playing an imaginary game with Tom. Uh, our, our, fi our finale for the first season of that uh, is going to go up online. Uh, don't forget, don't forget the big, you're burying the lead. Uh, weird things? No, you right. Why right. are you in that room? Game on. Oh, also, well, we're recording our, our the sequel to our uh, billboard charting comedy album, Night Attack, this week. Uh, and then also wherever, game on!
about a show about video games starring Brian Brushwood and the lovely and talented Veronica Belmont, uh, airing Sundays at 9 o'clock. And uh, this week, I'm going to write something that will probably get me fired. Yes. It'll be wonderful. By the way, if you guys want to send in your feedback, hit us up at frameratereshow at gmail.com. I guess that's it, Tom. We Good are better. actually, we're, we're not even just out of time. We owe you time. So look at the mail. We will be sending you a check for the balance of time we took from you today. We'll see you next week. It, it taps into some of the gestalt happening on the internet. I mean, there's really a building sentiment. There's a growing frustration with the way, with the old world way that all this is handled. And uh, it, while, meanwhile, technology and and again, it's Andrew Maine's quote, uh, but but technology outpaces legislation. Yeah. And uh, and as a result, we have an increased ability to to see anything we want on any device at any time, but a more restrictive legal situation that makes it harder for us to do that. And I think that's that's really ticking off most of the world. And I think as they become educated, that's the only way to make to make a change. Well I think and also to me the 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 beauty of the show is that it is speaking to a segment of the population that, you know, was all on board with the cord cutting revolution six years ago. Yeah. You know, when when it first started, when we first started to think this is something that could actually happen and is now frustrated that it's been six years and that bus hasn't well, showed up. And here's the thing. Six years ago, there were real technological problems, right? There was, oh, ah, sure. geez, how, how do I download an entire season of a television show on my crappy 1.5 megabit per second DSL connection, right? I mean, or I don't have enough storage on my hard drive. Those are all gone. There is right, yeah. no technological limitation on the ability to put Everything we want to watch online, on demand, anytime we want it, at a price. Yes. Not for free. Well, yes. At a price. Yeah. And yet, and, and, we can't do it. No, I think that there's, there's definitely, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, time. And, and, you know, for me, it was very, very interesting to see in one week, last week, the SOPA and the mega upload issues kind of happen because I found myself very strongly on on one side of popular current on one and on the opposite side of popular current. Oh, yeah, because... Well, right, you were so pro-SOPA, but you, you, you were uh, for... I was, was, was anti-Mega Uploads getting taken yeah, down. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, because I think... I think uh, it was... Uh, who'd you have on your SOPA episode? Uh, Declan Ryan McCullough Block. and Ryan Block. Yeah. Uh, he made a very good point, and I think it's something that, that has kind of been my, my mantra going forward with anybody I talked to SOPA about, which is uh, SOPA's not only a bad... Uh, idea and, and law, but we need to, uh, you know, be against anybody who says politically that further legislation of this kind of stuff is needed. Because if we look at, for everybody that might carve about the DMCA, we've evolved into a society where it's, where I think we're fairly okay with how it works. It requires you do stuff under penalty of perjury. Uh, you know, th there is, there is a recourse for when like UMG come game and take down TNT uh, there was a an ability to push back. There at least was a path, even if it didn't work very well. But it, there was a path. I, at least there was. I, I yeah. think that needs work as well. I agree, Having gone I, through but, it, I definitely think it needs work. I, However, I, I I I think what you're getting at, and what Ryan was getting at a little bit, is. And, and when I say this, I want to be very careful. I'm not saying, therefore, everybody go pirate. It's fine. We need to assess the harm. And that is not to say there is no harm to copyright infringement. There is. But we, for some reason, by saying copyright infringement causes harm, we leap to eliminates jobs, ruining the industry, costing billions of dollars. I don't think any of those are true in nearly the level that is alleged or even believed by the large part of the populace. Well, so and, and, let's actually assess what the actual damage is. I believe that if we did that, we would find that what we need are different protections for copyright, uh, not more protection for copyright. I, 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 totally, I think that we should never stop looking at it. However, I don't think that going, going further in the direction of legislation is necessarily what I personally politically want to support or I think is just. And uh, I, I do think that, that we do need to look at the harm. I mean, uh, did you happen to read on io9 their whole thing about manga? Uh, was it 
Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Manga, manga uh, is being killed by online piracy, like, well, like it's more a, popular a, than ever. Yeah, but, there, there's, yeah, there's a lot of reasons on why manga as, as, as an industry is kind of dying. But among them is that when you Google uh, major manga titles, the top seven results are, are pirate sites before you get to the sites that will sell them legitimately. And a lot of that goes to the companies not being good at creating good online solutions. But... At the end of the day, there still is, you know, in 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 this uh, you know vacuum, you can have a very corrosive uh, element kind of kind of pop up there. So, but anyway, I, I think it's just to me, I don't need further legislation, but I do believe that laws that we have as of now, not to say they can't be reformed, not to say they can't be made more accurate or better, but the laws that we have now should be enforced. Although I am very I'm very weird about how they took down Meg Upload. So you, yeah. So well, and, and keep in mind also, uh, didn't didn't the whole and I'm sure you guys have talked about this on TNT, but didn't the whole fact that they were able to put together a coalition to take down Mega Upload sort of cut the feet out from the the assertion that they need SOPA in order no, to stop? No, it didn't. Like, it didn't uh, because the servers are in Virginia and the customers are in Virginia, so it's all a U.S. thing. What SOPA okay. was addressing, and this is a misunderstanding of SOPA by a lot of people. SOPA was addressing when everything happens over the sea overseas. What do we do about it? What, what a lot of people don't realize is we already we already have SOPA for U.S. companies, and that's the Protect IP Act. And the Protect IP Act, Pro IP, is is what was used to take down Mega Upload. Uh, it's see. what it's what used by in, Immigration and Customs Enforcement to take down domain names in the U.S. SOPA was like we need to be able to do that to sites that we don't have any jurisdiction over. But they actually had jurisdiction over Mega Upload because Mega Upload was running servers in the United States, charging customers in the United States, and had customers in the United States. So it was that, that was a done deal. Uh, it was easy to go to other countries and say, hey, the, they're breaking the law in our country. We need your help. Everyone in the chat room is insisting that we include this on the episode. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. Uh uh. No, that's that's we ain't live. You don't get that's to see what it. you get for paying extra for the live <laughs> <laughs>